All right, good afternoon. So here we are for another lovely session of MENG 3310 Fluid Mechanics. Now, if you take a, note, uh, take a look at the clock in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see that I'm definitely recording this a bit late, uh, a bit later than I usually record my uh, lectures in class. And the reason for this is because, uh, well, today we did have class and we did go through this full lecture, but unfortunately the program uh, wasn't recording properly, so I hadn't uh, clicked the record button properly, and so now we're doing uh, well, actually, I'm doing in my office a little uh, makeup recording session. Anyway, because I don't want to get these uh, recorded for this semester. Okay, so this is going to be the 28th lecture in the video series, and I have a few objectives for today. Uh, first, I wish to differentiate between laminar and turbulent flow. Uh, second, classify pipe flow as either laminar, laminar or turbulent, and really that's where we'll finish up with today. Okay, so we've used a lot of these topics before in, in this class, in this lecture series. And so let us discuss laminar versus, turbul uh, versus turbulent flow. So laminar and turbulent flow. Now, we've really uh, hinted at a lot of this material through the semester, but uh, I don't think I ha have, as of yet, really gone through and specifically defined what these mean. So the assumption behind the, the first assumption in our, in our distinction between laminar and turbulent flow uh, will be that we'll be, we'll be dealing with a pipe completely filled uh, with the fluid or water. Uh, so for pipe flow, our pipe, the pipe will be completely filled with fluid. It is completely filled with fluid. So there's no air in it, there's no gaps, there's no, um, it's not that you have two, okay, you could have, for example, you could have two uh, different uh, substances that really didn't like dissolving in each other and those are both going to the pipe at the same time, kind of a homogenous uh, solution. That, that's not what we're dealing with. We're, or sorry, not homogenous, uh, heterogeneous uh, solution, uh, solution or something like that, or mixture, I guess it wouldn't be a solution, it'd be a mixture. But anyway, um, so we're dealing with a nice single material flowing through a pipe, single fluid, etc. Now, I also want to define uh, two different terms. Uh, we've obviously used the word pipe a lot in this class, but I would like to distinguish between the term pipe and conduit. At least for our purposes, a pipe will be a round conduit. Oh, sorry, not conduit, duct. So this is your typical uh, conduit. This is what we use for transporting water, oil, hydraulic fluid, whatever it may be. Usually you're transporting uh, liquids through round, uh, through round um, conduits. And ultimately the reason for that is that of course a circle is the shape that has the minimum surface area to volume or, or perimeter to volume. So that means you need, if, especially when you have things that are under pressure, you will need the uh, absolute minimum material to make a, uh, a pipe or a conduit capable of transforming or transferring a certain amount of fluid uh, if you make it round. Uh, of course, the downside is that can be more difficult to manufacture, more difficult to support, and some other things. But so a duct would be something like a non-round. It would be a non-round conduit. Typically, something like a square or a rectangle. So for something like a HVAC system, a air conditioning heating system, a centralized heating system, things like that, you tend to use a square conduit uh, or, or ductwork, as you've. Uh, you've probably heard it called before, ductwork, common HVAC ductwork. Uh, duct and the reason that it's square is, well, it's ultimately, it ultimately it is going to be, uh, even though a circle would be more efficient or a tubular, a uh, circular uh, pipe would be more efficient at transferring in terms of material efficiency, uh, in terms of fabrication, in terms of support, in terms of uh, installation, a square can often be simpler than a round conduit. However, the uh, they're typically used only for cases where you have relatively low pressures. Uh, things like, well, example of course would be the HVAC system. You're not, yes, the air inside a HVAC system is slightly pressurized. We're talking low pressures. We're not talking, you know, many, many atmospheres of pressure inside a 
um, a common you know HVAC ductwork, if you were to pressurize that to even two atmospheres, it would just burst right open. So you're dealing with relatively minor pressure differences uh, between inside and outside the conduit, so it's practical to make it a square. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. So let us consider a system where we're looking at, let's consider the following system, and I'll use this to illustrate the difference between laminar and turbulent flow. Now imagine that we have a vessel, say a large pressure vessel, or it could be a tank of water or a tank of fluid or whatever it is. It could be either pressurized under heat and pressure or, or by a pump, or it could just be pressurized by a gravity. There's maybe this container goes up quite high. And so let's say you had a, um, so you're going to have a pipe. Uh, so here we have a vessel. And here we have a smooth, uh, well-rounded opening. smooth, well-rounded opening or entrance. So we're not going to lose a lot of energy going from the tank to the pipe. And of course, this thing would have a diameter D. Would have a diameter D. And perhaps here, there is a flow rate Q equals VA. Q equals velocity times cross-sectional area. Then, um, so the fluid is going to come up from the tank, enter into the tank, and flow through the fluid, or flow into the pipe. Now, so that's the general setup here. Then, to this, I add something else. I'm going to add a droplet dispenser. So, if you want to visualize this, think of some, think of one of those, uh, Oh, small uh, straw-like contraptions you use uh, to disperse water to say like a hamster or something like that. It has a very narrow opening so that it the fluid cannot flow out of this very rapidly. It's not it, they don't literally use one of those, but some the similar construction. And you um, the whole purpose of this design is that it's filled with a different color fluid. Now usually the the fluid that we're going to be looking at will have to be clear or mostly clear like water is. But then your dye, so we'll have a dye tank here filled with some red or blue or other or green or other brightly colored fluid. And what it's going to do is it is going to slowly release a stream of particles. And because this stream is a very small portion of the overall volume, uh, it's not really going to affect the, flu the flow of the fluid. It's going to stick with the fluid. It's going to be carried along by the motion of the fluid. But it is, but the uh, the tiny amount of fluid coming out of this droplet uh, dispenser is really not going to have an effect on the overall behavior of the fluid. So, if I were to look at this and I were to look at uh, how the streamlines for these behave, for both or how the dye behaves for both uh, turbulent or for both uh, laminar, uh, transitional and turbulent, it would look like this. So let me do the simple one first. It would be the laminar case. So I'm, uh, this is the system that I'm working with, and I'm going to draw three cases of it uh, over here. So the first one would be laminar flow. Now the key to remember laminar flow is to think. Uh, you can think of this actually just from the word, from the word laminar. That probably brings to mind things like laminate. It brings to think mind things like well, laminar. Uh, if you think of the word laminate, I think of. Um, of course, a uh, laminated uh, things like laminated lumber come to mind, or, or um, if you think of a laminating piece of paper, where you have a piece of paper and you uh, place it between two layers of plastic, that would be a laminated object. And laminate laminar means uh, sheets, it means planes, it means that kind of thing. So, and what that means in this context is, if I were to go and release a, if I were to release one streamline here, one die line. I shouldn't say streamline, I should say die line. It would just go perfectly horizontally right along. Uh, if I release something at the middle of the pipe, it will just go right down the middle of the pipe. It won't be disturbed at all. Then if I were to release, I could release, if I wanted to, I could release another one at the top of the pipe. And it also would go along perfectly uh, flat and horizontal, just like this. And I could do it again at the bottom of the pipe, and the same kind of behavior would be observed. So essentially, uh, every the, the fluid just kind of moves in nice uh, flat sheets or nice fat, nice flat streams. Uh, 
uh, depending on your perspective. If you want to consider it a, a series of like pencil-like lines or a series of sheets, either one is fine. And so everything's just moving slowly along, just going, uh, perf just going horizontally along, uh, nothing really changing. Now, what if you have turbulent flow? Well, turbulent flow is the opposite. Turbulent flow is going to be the opposite. Now, if you want a good way of visualizing turbulent, tur uh, if you want a good way of visualizing turbulent flow, uh, how I always visualize it, which is not exactly proper, would be something like a whitewater rapids. Uh, that is where you have fluid that is rolling and churning, and, and almost it looks like it's boiling, but it's it's not really. Um, it's it's a very uh, chaotic system. So when I say whitewater rapids, think about uh, maybe up in a stream up in the Rocky Mountains that you know people pay to get put on a raft and they wear a helmet and they get jostled around by the current, their big raft, you know, bumps off rocks and sometimes they get thrown out of the raft and have to float downstream and all this kind of, uh, it's kind of a fun sporting event. But now that is not a perfect analogy because uh, in this case, the uh, there is no air inside the pipe. So it's not like we literally have, you know, whitewater rapids type conditions inside the pipe, but we still do have rolling and churning currents um, rotating bits of vortices and things like that inside the pipe. But uh, we're doing that without having any air gaps in there. So whitewater rapids are not a perfect analogy, but they do uh, visualize it quite, uh, quite clearly. But what would a streamline look like there? Well, it would end up looking something like this. So, some, so the particles would be released here, the dye particles, and sometimes uh, at each individual, it would still form a, 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 co a cohesive line, but it would be look. It would look like it's taking some kind of random walk. So this is would not follow any kind of pattern. It would just it would look like a wave of just very uh, random amplitude and wavelength. So what's happening here is sometimes it, it's releasing a stream of particles, but it's being bent and twisted along the way uh, from the turbulent flow. And then in between, I have what's known as the transition zone the transition zone. And this is really, well, as the name states, or as the name suggests, it is a transition between laminar and, tur and turbulent flow. Transition uh, flow. I should maybe say transitional flow. Transitional flow, if I can fit that in there. There, problem solved. And it would look sort of like a combination of these. And on one extreme, the, the transitional flow would be indistinguishable from laminar flow. On the other extreme, it would be indistinguishable from turbulent flow. So if I'm going to draw it somewhere in the middle, it would look something kind of like this. Maybe some slight deviations from, from laminar, but still largely recognizable by laminar, but there's still something, there's still some significant deviations there. All right. So um, then I could also look at the time dependence of a uh, fluid velocity at a point. What if I look at a single point? Consider a single point. And the velocity at that point versus time. The fluid velocity at that point versus time. it would also exhibit a similar behavior. So if I put a sensor at one specific location and just record versus time what the, oh, let's say, at say at point A, so here I'd have maybe UA, which would be the X velocity, the horizontal velocity at a point versus time. Well, the horizontal velocity for laminar would be nice and constant, it would not change. For laminar, it would be like this, just a constant horizontal velocity uh, versus time. Uh, turbulent, it would even the horizontal velocity would not be constant. It would be going on some random walk kind of behavior. Because there are vortices, there are vortices involved, and sometimes the uh, and sometimes that would cause a decrease or an increase in the horizontal velocity of the particle of particles passing point A. So this would be laminar turbulent 
and then somewhere in between. Transitional. All right, so let's continue on. Now, moving on, uh, we're going to start discussing some of the mathematics of this. And uh, the flow we're going to consider is uh, what's known as fully developed flow. Um, we will consider only fully developed flow. In this class, we don't look much at uh, non-fully developed flow. And you'll see why in a bit. Um, fully developed flow. And what do I mean by fully developed flow? Well, um, this means that the velocity profile does not change with time. So the velocity profile uh, does not change with time. And uh, also another way to think of this is when I say the, when I say fully developed flow, uh, think about when I activate a faucet. Uh, think about when you have a hose or think about a time when you say, um, oh, I don't know, had a hose and you opened it and um, you watched the uh, fluid flow out of it, that kind of thing. Um, now, uh, let's say the first time you did that, or not the first time, let's say when you do that, what happens? Well, initially the fluid is going to be um, fully, um, initially the fluid is going to be fully at, uh, sorry, initially the hose is gonna be completely filled with air. Then after that point, uh, once, you open the no once you open the valve, water or uh, some other fluid starts flowing into the hose, and uh, past that point, the um, uh, past that point, the uh, fluid is f uh, forcing the air out of the system. So at the beginning, it's all air. When it's all done, it's it's fully uh, it's all water. But in the middle, it's kind of mixed up. So let's consider that then. Well, um, here. So the question then becomes, what is causing, uh, what is forcing the flow through the pipe? My question is, what is forcing uh, fluid to flow, flow through a pipe? So we're only looking at fully developed flow. That's where the system, there's the city, the system is now at steady state. There's just as much fluid coming into the system as as is as is exiting the system. It's sort of reached a, an equilibrium. Uh, what is forcing fluid through a pipe? And the answer is a change in pressure. There must be some sort of energy loss in the system. There is in any real pipe. There is going to be energy loss. So um, let us consider that here. And so let us say I have a pipe. And let me draw some dimensions. A This here, let's say we have a pipe of radius R of length L. So radius R and length L. And then let me look at this in terms of a free body diagram. I'll look at the forces on this pipe, on the fluid inside this pipe. One would be P, the pressure, times pi R squared. And the other might be uh, P plus DP times pi R squared. And this must mean um, that there is a change in pressure here. There, there has to be some sort of DP in order to cause a fluid flow, in order to cause some sort of fluid flow. There's always going to be a change in pressure along the length of a pipe. Ultimately, that is what's causing um, fluid to flow through a pipe and to overcome its own, uh, to overcome its own um, internal friction and things like that. So now for laminar flow, we do have a law we can use and I'm going to try to pronounce the French, but I'm going to definitely screw this up. P-O-I-S-E-U-I-L-L-E. Poussui or Poussa, Poussili. I am really not good at French class. Um, Mr. P's law. Uh, anyway, this is for laminar flow only. 
We'll generally be using other equations, but this can be useful for laminar flow. Only useful for laminar flow. And we still need to, uh, and coming up, I will actually describe how mathematically we can uh, determine whether something really is laminar flow. Now, if I look at the, that here, so consider a pipe. Consider a pipe like this. If I have points 1 and point 2, and then a flow rate Q going through this pipe. A flow rate Q going through this. And then I have a certain length L. So I'm looking at a pipe that's at an angle. That's not just my poor art skills. That is uh, deliberate. A certain length L and a certain diameter D. And let's say this thing is at an angle phi. Is that some angle phi? Then, let's see here. I could have, uh, and this law describes, Pousselis or Pousselis law says that Q is equal to pi d to the fourth over 128 mu l, 128 mu times l. So pi times the diameter to the fourth power over 128 mu times l, or l, l is length of pipe and mu is the dynamic viscosity, or just the viscosity, and then this times delta p minus gamma l uh, sine of phi. Now, if Q is uh, equal, or sorry, not Q, if uh, phi is zero, uh, or in other words, a horizontal pipe, this law collapses to the following. This law collapses to Q equals pi d to the fourth over 128 mu L delta P. So using this, if I had horizontal pipe, I could measure the pressure on one side, the pressure on the other side, measure the diameter, and then predict the, and if I knew the length, I could predict the flow rate that I would have through that pipe. Or vice versa, if I knew the flow rate, I could predict the uh, drop in pressure. And that would be very useful. This, this equation would be very useful for designing something like a a uh, water system or something like that. So this is the first example I will show you of a tool we can use to predict losses in pipes. And uh, I'm, we'll see most of this in later lectures, but this is the real, the first tool that we've seen in this class that can be used to directly predict the energy loss in a system or in a pipe um, from viscous forces. Now, this is important, and the reason it's important, well, for a variety of reasons, but one major reason this is important is Imagine if you had to, imagine if you were designing a water system, say you wanted to um, give water, provide uh, drinking water, bathing water, whatever, all the kind of water service people, all the kind of uses that, all the kinds of things people use water for, so residential water service. And let's say you wanted to design such a system. Well, to really do that effectively, to do that mathematically, you're going to need to be able to mathematically predict what kind of pressure drop you're going to get as a uh, you know as pipe as water flows through pipes over many thousands of feet over even miles, and so um, if you are going to do that, I mean imagine if you did if you couldn't predict it mathematically, you would have to, you know maybe use a rule of thumb and guess. Okay, well we used this size pipe last time and it worked out right. We had this kind of pressure drop, so let's try it again this time. Then you go and you build your pipe and you you uh, find that oh no I don't have an, I have too much. Uh, pressure drop here. Oh no! And so I, I have too little pressure drop, and or too great greater pressure drop. Viscous forces are controlling everything, are dominating it. And oh well, I guess I needed. I really needed an eight-inch pipe there instead of a six-inch pipe. I guess I'll just better go and uh, dig out that you know thousand foot of pipe that I just laid down, and you know tear it all out and start all over again. Um, that would be quite expensive and would make the whole process completely impractical. So. Um, if you want to look at, I could also look at this from the point of view of energy considerations. So let's look at this from the point of view of energy.
energy considerations. Well, of course, remember from Bernoulli. Bernoulli is going to, and we spent a lot of time talking about this. Well, Bernoulli assumes that the total head along the uh, a um, is constant along streamline. Along a streamline. In other words, we do not no energy is lost from the system, no energy is gained by the system. Uh, the delta HT along the system is zero. Delta HT along the system is zero. Uh, however, uh, so again, we're not uh, we can in Bernoulli we can trade energy back and forth between pressure head, velocity head, and elevation head, but the total head along the system is constant. So the delta of the H is zero. Or um, in reality, however, um, in reality we do lose energy from the flow, mainly from viscous forces. Uh, in the flow, in all practical and real situations, it is impossible to have a fluid flow without some energy being lost in the system. Even when a um, a fluid flows through only a quarter inch of pipe, there is still going to be some minor loss or some amount of loss between one side of that pipe and the other. In fact, there is only one case that I'm that I'm aware of that you can truly have zero viscous losses in a fluid. Now some materials or some substances have close to zero or you have, you know, very low viscosity fluid. Um, but there is one case that I'm aware of where it is truly nothing and that is the, the state of superfluidity, which you might want to uh, research or look up. They have a nice Wikipedia article on that if you want a very quick, if perhaps less rigorous primer. Um, so superfluidity is a state where, uh, much like super, super much like superconductivity, where you can have electrical flow with zero electrical with zero electrical resistance. In superfluidity, you can have uh, fluid flow, physical fluid flow, with uh, zero viscous losses. So uh, the primary case I'm aware of it is where you have something like a. Uh, uh, liquid helium cooled down to cryogenic temperatures, you know, tiny, you know, fractions of a degree Kelvin and things like that. And if you had a, I don't know, if you if you had a super flu, a, a super fluid helium, a super cooled, you know, liquid helium, and you uh, had a vessel of it, and you spun, and you say you stirred it with a spoon and got a little circular current going, uh, it would just keep turning forever, literally, as long as you kept it cold enough, it experiences no viscous forces, and it will just keep turning forever. So, um, kind of interesting. Uh, and there's all sorts of really spooky things that it does. It can actually, um, if you have a, if you have, say, a vessel, normally we know that, I'll just do this to the side here. Normally we know that in a vessel there's kind of a meniscus formed. Like if you think of a beaker, there's a, the, the, the material, the, uh, the fluid always sort of rides up the um, walls of the vessel. Now we think of this as, you know, sort of it sort of asymptotically approaches zero, but it never actually reaches it. Well, the same thing happens here, except because there's no viscous losses, uh, in reality, like all, at the edge of any kind of cup or open top vessel, it's a fluid is always doing this kind of thing where it's sort of clinging a bit to the walls, and it doesn't really ever reach zero thickness. That so even at the peak of the vessel, there's probably like a you know an atom thick layer of water or something like that. But with Superfluidity, because there's no because there's no resistance to flow. Let me go that way. Uh, because there's no resistance to flow, it can just kind of creep and flow outside the walls of its vessel. So you need to keep superfluid helium in closed containers. Otherwise, what it will do is it will actually ride up the climb up the walls of the vessel and drop down. And this doesn't violate conservation of energy because the overall gravitational potential energy of the system will be decreasing. It's actually harnessing that and creating its own siphon kind of thing. It can actually, that's one of the creepiest things about superfluids is that they can actually creep up the walls of their vessels and drop down uh, the bottom as if by some spooky magic. But anyway, something you want to read up on. Uh, that has, in most kind, in really any kind of engineering design system, except, well, except, well, I guess, 
you might be able to have that in, say, uh, something like, a, you actually might have to deal with something like that in a uh, uh, MRI machine design or other system where you're using uh, liquid helium as a coolant. But those are fairly exotic systems, and, bas and basically everything we deal with, it is very real, uh, very rare to actually deal with superfluids. So um, any kind of system that we're really dealing with, we're going to be dealing with something that has some amount of viscous losses. So anyway, and in reality, we do have uh, some losses, and this uh, change in head from one point to two, from points one to two, would be equal to the head loss from point one to two. So again, HL is going to be the head loss And we'll work on this a bit more next time. Uh, but not done yet. And this is mostly due to viscous forces, again, head loss. Now, there is an important note. Uh, note, uh, head loss cannot be negative in the direction of flow. It cannot. It cannot be negative in the direction of flow. If you work through an energy balance equation and you find that the uh, head loss is negative, really, you know, one of two things happened. Um, either one, you did you screwed something up and did the math wrong, or two, you assumed the fluid was traveling in the wrong direction. If you did everything correct, uh, if you did all the, the mathematics and all everything, all the substitution, everything else correctly, but you got a negative head loss, it doesn't mean you necessarily are uh, finding something impossible. It just means that the um, it means that the fluid is flowing in the other direction, or it might just mean that there would be uh, well, actually, yeah, I mean the fluid is flowing in the other direction. So, if I look at this from our old energy balance, our, our old Bernoulli formula, it would be something like p uh, over gamma plus v squared over 2g plus z for um, at, position, at a position 1 minus p over gamma plus v squared over 2g plus z for position 2 is equal to the head loss from 1 to 2. Uh, and so again we've now put all put so we've now created a difference between the two energy states the uh, pressure velocity and elevation heads subtracted them from each other and said so the difference is um, the head loss. Now, we can also include things like pumps and turbines. So for example, I could add a, um, if, I were, if I were going to think about a pump which adds energy to the system, I could say plus H of pump. If there was a pump that was adding energy to the system, well, I'd want to make it added, I want to add it on this other side. And if I was, if I had a turbine that was removing energies for the system, I would say it might be something like minus H turbine. Then I can also break head loss down into two things. Head loss is going to be equal to head loss major plus head loss minor. And we will work with this more next class. Well, the major head loss is the major is called major because it well it is the larger one, and it is due mainly to vi uh, friction in pipes, your viscous friction. Uh, head loss uh, minor minor head loss. These are what I call like local things, like small things, uh, things like elbows, uh, pi uh, elbows, uh, valves, filters, that kind of thing. Small one-off local appurtenances, elbows, valves filters, filters, etc. Friction, elbows, valves, filters, etc. Now, um, major head loss is uh, occurs over the long stretches of pipes. So, you know, uh, uh, when we calculate head loss later on, when we learn how to calculate that, we're going to calculate it all in terms of, you know, per linear foot, like head loss, delta, uh, you know, uh, atmospheres per thousand foot, or atmospheres per meter, or, or psi per foot, or uh, some unit of length, a uh, pressure drop per unit length, or per length, or something like that. And that is the basic idea. It is a unit loss. It's a it's the loss from uh, some minor minor head loss will just be a value, just like 
we lose a, a foot of head, or we lose half a foot of head, or we lose a certain pressure PSI, that this one valve causes X amount of pressure loss. It's not, a valve doesn't cause a loss per linear foot, it is just a loss whenever the water goes through, or whenever a fluid goes through the valve. Major head loss is calculated per length, so the, more, the longer a pipe you have, the more uh, losses you have. And really, it's the reason we call this major and this minor is that in most systems, this is what really dominates, especially any system that you have long lengths of pipe, now, you, in some mechanical engineering systems, if you have like a, an engine, uh, minor head losses might actually dominate the system because you don't often have, you know, except maybe in a radiator, but you don't often have, you know, many, many miles of tubing inside an engine, but you do have plenty of valves and, and uh, elbows and bends and filters and things like that. And so that might be a case where uh, minor losses are really dominating the system. But anyway, so I would like to end today with actually mathematically defining what both laminar and turbulent flow means. So first, uh, let's look at laminar flow and turbulent flow from the point of view of um, velocity fields. Laminar flow and turbulent flow. So here, in the laminar flow case, Velocity will be in the x-direction only, and this is, um, when I'm saying x-direction only, what I mean by this is I have a system kind of like this. Here's my pipe. I have my x-axis along the length of the pipe, maybe my y-axis vertically, and maybe my oh, z-axis going into the page, or something like that. Yeah, that works with the right-hand rule. Uh, so, in laminar flow, the velocity vector in x only. So particles are moving only in the x direction. So they may be here moving in the x direction, they may be here moving in the x direction, but they're moving only in the x direction. So my velocity vector is something like u i, my, um, fu my x function here, uh, and then times uh, the unit vector i. So there is no vertical in the y or side-to-side -side motion in the z, and it's more steady, less random, etc. And then turbulent flow, it's still mostly in the x, it's almost all in the x, but there are still some components in the, uh, in the y and the z. So turbulent flow, velocity mostly in x, but has components in y and z. Uh, in y and z. And so you'll get something like our regular velocity fields that we've seen previously. Uh, so v equals ui plus vj plus uh, wk plus wk. And again, at turbulent flow, we're dealing with more, uh, with, it's a more random flow, and it's much higher speeds. Now, um, I wish to conclude today with defining um, what Reynolds number means. Uh, well, we've already seen what Reynolds numbers mean, or not what Reynolds number means, but uh, I want to show how we use this to define mathematically the difference between uh, laminar and turbulent flow. Uh, so Reynolds number here, and we saw this previously when we were working with, with pi terms. Uh, Reynolds number RE Reynolds number RE and this is now we mentioned before that it was one of the most important or perhaps even the most important um, dimensionless number or pi term found in fluid mechanics and really the reason why is that this distinguishes flow and when I say distinguish, I don't mean like distinguish in the manner of give honor to or give praise to, but uh, classification. This is very respect. This is a very respectable flow. So anyway, uh, Reynolds number, if we remember from previously, can be defined two ways. It can be rho v d over mu, uh, rho v d over mu, uh, or we can say Reynolds number 
is equal to v d over nu over nu. Then uh, let me again lay out what all these things are as a review from last week. Again, that's fairly straightforward. Don't want that one. That's a little. Don't want blood red. Uh, rho, of course, is our density. Uh, v is our velocity. And both of these formulations, if you run through the units, these are, uh, or if you run through the dimensions, these will be dimensionless. D is our, is our diameter. Uh, mu is our dynamic viscosity, which we, we often refer to as just viscosity. So usually you'll hear me refer to just viscosity as mu, but the technical term is actually dynamic viscosity, uh, where we're considering you know uh, mass in there. And nu is a kinematic viscosity. Where this is, of course, nu equals, uh, nu is equal to mu over rho. Isn't that lovely? That's one of my favorite um, equations from fluid mechanics, just because it's so wonderfully dense in Greek letters. It's great. Nu equals mu over rho. And uh, I love it. It's just so wonderfully obtuse. It's great. It's a beautiful equation. It's a beautiful but simple equation. Anyway, and what's even better, it's, it uses some of the more um, least used Greek letters, especially, especially the nu. But uh, anyway, uh, so if I look here then, now let me look at this rho vd over mu. Well, let's think about this. Let's look at rho vd over mu. Or actually, sorry, just the rho vd. Rho vd. What is that? Well, kilograms. Uh, so let me look at the units for metric, for example, in, a, in an MLT system. Kilograms per cubic meter for our, our rho. Uh, v is going to be in meters per second. And d is in diameter. OK. Uh, so we have that over meters cubed. Well, we'll have kilogram meters per second, right? Kilogram meters per second. Um, anyway, kilograms per cubic meter, rho vd. So that would be kilogram per meter second. But anyway, that didn't come out quite as I'd hoped, but that's OK. Um, well, let's see. So that's going to be here. Well, I was thinking in terms of a. Actually, I'd have to multiply. I would have to multiply by a to get the, to actually get the kill. I was thinking, oh, can I actually get kilograms per second? No, I can't because I would actually need to uh, consider the cross-sectional area. But that's fine. Whatever. What I really want to get at here is that this relates to kilograms per second. Uh, if I just multiplied this by another diameter, I would get uh, kilograms per second. So, or in other words, what this really comes down to is my numerator here can be thought of as my inertial force. The higher this is, say the higher the density is, or the higher the velocity is, or the greater the diameter, I have more inertia in the system. So that's a measure of the inertial force in the pipe at a given time. And then mu down here, what is this? Well, this is the viscous force. So the higher this, the more the system is dominated by inertial forces. The higher this, the more the system is dominated by viscous forces. So again, let me show a summary here. Uh, when uh, viscous forces are greater than um, inertial forces, or when viscous forces are much higher, that means that uh, Reynolds number becomes lower because the uh, viscous forces or the viscosity are in the denominator. So that means a lower, a lower Reynolds number, which means uh, flow tends to be more laminar because uh, when you have more viscous flow, you tend to get more laminar flow. Think of that laminated sheet. Uh, Laminar flow is a sort of very low energy state. It's in the lower energy states. So things are sort of slowly sliding past each other. So think of a, you know, an ice skater just slowly skating along the ice. It's a, it's a slow thing. Um, 
so viscous forces when you have viscous flow uh, if viscous forces get their way you're going to end up with very smooth steady things um, things are only moving just as much as they have to they're not going out of their way to r run around in the in the y direction or the z direction they're just going nice and slowly along in the uh, x direction minimizing the movement minimizing the energy uh, viscous flow a very thick viscous flow is very low slow velo uh, slow um, steady flow but then when, when uh, inertial forces are very high compared to viscous forces, that's where you get turbulent flow. When inertial forces are very high, this leads to a very high Reynolds number. Um, so the flow is more turbulent. I think of it as just, you know, imagine a whole bunch of people trying to cram through a door at one location or people, or think of a, uh, if you want to think of a colorful uh, analogy, think of a, uh, one of those videos of Bla uh, Black Friday shopping or something where there's a whole bunch of people rushing through the door and they're just jostling past each other and pushing and shoving and really throwing their weight around and trying to get in to get that, you know, save $20 on a television that they, you know, camped out overnight for. But anyway, uh, let's not, a, let's not uh, get into um, editorialism here. So that's the basic idea that when you have viscous force, when viscous forces are very high relative to inertial forces, that means the denominator of the Reynolds number equation will be larger, which means the flow tends to be more laminar. When the opposite is the case, when your inertial forces are high, either your density is very high or your um, or your uh, velocity is very high uh, or your area is very high you tend, or your diameter is very high, you tend to get more, uh, the, the viscous, sorry, the inertial forces will dominate the viscous forces and you'll get more turbulent flow. Now that's all well and good. We've learned how to calculate a particular Reynolds number, but how do I actually predict mathematically whether a flow will be laminar, turbulent, or transitional? Well, um, I have seen different variations of this and you, uh, if you look in different texts, you can actually find different numbers quoted. Uh, and it, the reason for this is that it can be, it can be somewhat subjective whether you call something turbulent or laminar, because as we saw, they smoothly transition into one another. So um, these are the rules of thumb that I have read, although you may um, see slightly different variations. So for a pipe, Reynolds number that is less than 2100, we can call laminar flow. When the Reynolds number is greater than four is uh, so when uh, Reynolds number is greater than four thousand, you can have turbulent flow. And when the Reynolds number is between, you'll have the transitional flow. So between twenty one hundred and twenty four hundred, this would be transitional flow. And as a reminder, uh, the units don't matter here. These Reynolds number is a dimensionless number as long, as long as you're using a consistent unit system. Now, if you have your diameter in meters and you use your uh, density as slugs per you know cubic foot and you just throw those together, well, then your numbers would be off. Um, but as long as you're using a consistent unit system, uh, Reynolds number is dimensionless. So uh, there you have it. And this is a good rule of thumb mathematically to predict whether something is turbulent, laminar, or uh, transitional. And later on, uh, in, the next, in this week and next, we will see how to predict, we'll look at some more tools uh, other than the one equation we've seen so far of how to predict uh, viscous and uh, turbulent losses in pipes. All right, that'll do it for today. Thank you for watching, and as always, thank you.